Okay. Check one, two. Those thinking far away. Is it on? No, it's not. And I sat down to play and they turned me off. <laughs> All right, good morning. Y'all say hello, choir. That'll make him be quiet and listen to me. Maybe. All right, so uh, a couple of uh, quick announcements. Uh, Jesse Spear has a special invitation for you first, and I've got two quick things. I just wanted to invite everyone to a concert tomorrow evening right here in this room. Uh, the Greater Texoma Jazz Orchestra is going to be playing. Uh, we play at 7 o'clock. It's free of charge, so if you are a lover of music or a lover of jazz, please show up and show some support. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. And I've been to that, and they are really, really good, and it's a fun evening, so if you can make it, please do so. My two quick announcements are, men, don't forget to sign up for the men's retreat. The deadline is this Thursday at noon, so you have to call, you have to sign up, you have to pay your money because we have to pay Falls Creek for you coming. It's $115, $110 per person, I think. Uh, So if you will get that taken care of, it's going to be a great time. I'm looking forward to it, some time away. 
with some guys and to be encouraged by God's Word will be a fun time together. So I encourage you to sign up for that if you have not yet. And then secondly, uh, remind you that we are having the picnic today, but we are having it in the gym because between 2 and 3, there's a 75% chance of rain. I know it probably won't rain all day, but we're going to be safe and we're going to meet in the gym. Uh, they've been cooking hamburgers and hot dogs over there uh, on the grill, and they are smelling good, and everything set up over there. So as soon as we get through today, go by there. If you brought your lawn chairs, there's room in the gym for your lawn chairs. We did not set up chairs, so go ahead and bring your lawn chairs in. If you don't have a lawn chair, we'll provide a chair for you, but we'll have a good time. We're still doing the, the cornhole tournament and all the games and all those things, so it'll be a good time. Also want to let you know that today we're doing the Easter presentation uh, of worship by the choir. Jackie did not um, feel led this year to do a whole um, hour-long presentation, but the word he kept hearing from the Lord was, let's just worship. So as the choir leads, uh, you're invited to worship. You might be looking around going, where's Jackie? At the end of the first service, Jackie got really ill, and he is home and so pray for him. So uh, uh, Susie uh, has had a 20-minute tutorial. <laughs> tutorial, And uh, so she's going to step in and lead, so it'll be a little different. Uh, but it's going to be wonderful. But the whole gist of this is it's not a performance by the choir for you to sit and watch. It's an activity of worship. So let's all, the words will be on the screen. So we encourage you to worship along with the choir. Right now... Just going to stay in your zip codes, but stand up and let's welcome and greet one another. song, but my phone's down there, oh well. (coughs) 
Well, this first song is called This Blood. It's talking specifically. All of these songs have to do with the blood of Jesus that was shed for us. And so this first song is called This Blood. And as I thought about the words of this song, I thought about Matthew 26, verse 28, that says this, This is my blood that establishes the new covenant. It is shed for many for the forgiveness of sin. So as you listen to this song, we're thinking specifically about the blood of Jesus, the God-man who shed his blood for us. And I am not Darla. This was supposed to be Darla. I got the same tutorial Susie got, but I know that Jackie and Darla would want all of us to worship as best as possible, so please sing with me.
you think you've been practicing that all week. <laughs> she literally got called at 1038 and let her know she was going to sing that. So praise the Lord for that. You know, the blood does us no good unless we apply it. And uh, this next song talks about how we apply the blood of Jesus. Think about what Hebrews 9.22 says. It says that almost everything according to the law must be covered in blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And so in the Old Testament, when you brought your sacrifice to the temple, the priest would sacrifice it, would take the blood and take some of the hyssop branch and sprinkle it on the altar, the blood of your sacrifice, signifying the covering of your sin. And so now we know the blood of Jesus covers our sin. And aren't we glad we don't have to go through all that process of going to the temple and sacrificing an animal because Jesus once and for all became our final sacrifice. Oh 
You got me here, Bill? There we go. They talk about uh, love languages. Some people's love languages, service. Some people's love languages, affirmation, uh, romance. And different people have different ways they express their love. What is God's love language? His love language is love. And love is the language that God speaks. This next song is titled, My King is Known by Love. And that's really what we know God by, His love. In 1 John 4, it says this, God's love was revealed to us in this way. God sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. Love consists in this, not that we love God, but that He loved us. Amen. Some are known by great authority For kingdoms as far as eyes can see In royal robes they rule from thrones Waging wars they overthrow the weak And they call it victory but my king is known by mercy. My king is known by grace. For the hope in his name and the power that saves. My king is known by My King is known by an empty grave. Oh, and all that He does, my King is known by love. I can almost see Him even now. Rejected with thorns upon his brow. What kind of king would leave his throne and make my sin and shame his own? And yet he gave his life for me. He gave his life for me. And my king is known by that welcomes everyone as his daughters and his sons and no one is ever turned away In his name 
and the power that
I'm on? Okay, I couldn't hear myself. So the title of the message is TGFF. You might look at that and think, well, Brother Mike made a typo. It should be TGIF. No, it's TGFF, not thank God it's Friday, but thank God for Friday. Because today we're on Friday of Passion Week, and of course we call it Good Friday. And it's not Good Friday because it was good for Jesus, because it was anything but good for Him. It's Good Friday because it was good for us. Amen. The outcome was good, because in His death we can be saved. On Thursday of the last week of Jesus' life here on the earth, he implemented what we refer to as the Lord's Supper. He ate the Passover, celebrated the Passover with his disciples on Thursday. And then he went out to the Garden of Gethsemane where he prayed so earnestly that his sweat became as drops of blood, we are told. He was arrested brought up on false charges before the Sanhedrin, which is a combination of Pharisees and Sadducees and chief priests and teachers of the law, the, the religious leaders of Jerusalem and Israel. It was illegal to have such a trial at night, so they reconvened in the morning, it tells us in chapter 15, verse 1 of the Gospel of Mark. They reconvened at daylight so they could make it legal and tidy, and then they bound him and took him and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate found no fault in Jesus, wanted to release him. They began to beg for Pilate to release Barabbas, which name means son of the father. Instead of releasing Jesus, who was innocent, he releases Barabbas, who was guilty. And he asked the crowd, what then should I do with Jesus? They began to yell all the more, crucify him, crucify him. And that's where we pick up the story today. In Mark 15, if you would turn to Mark 15, verse 21, we're going to read through the end of Mark 15. If you would stand with me as together we honor the reading of God's Word. Mark 15, verse 21. They forced a man coming in from the country who was passing by to carry Jesus' cross. He was Simon, a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, and they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means skull place. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. Then they crucified him and divided his clothes, casting lots for them to decide what each would get. Now it was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge written against him was, The King of the Jews. They crucified two criminals with him, one on his right and one on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled that says, And he was counted among outlaws. Those who passed by were yelling insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, Ha! The one who would demolish the sanctuary and build it in three days, save yourself by coming down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests with the scribes were mocking him to one another, saying, He saved others, but he cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross so that we may see and believe. Even those who were crucified with him were taunting him. When it was noon... Darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, Look, he's calling for Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, fixed it on a reed, and offered him a drink, and said, Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. But Jesus let out a loud cry and breathed his last. Then the curtain of the sanctuary was split in two from top to bottom. When the centurion who was standing opposite him saw the way he breathed his last, he said, this man really was God's son. There were also many women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they would follow him and help him. Many other women would come up with him. To Jerusalem. When it was already evening, because it was preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the Sanhedrin who was himself looking forward to the kingdom of God, came and boldly went into Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked whether he had already died. When he found out from the centurion, he gave the corpse to Joseph. After he bought some fine linen, he took him down and wrapped him in the linen. Then he placed him in a tomb cut out of the rock. 
and rolled a stone against the entrance to the tomb. Now Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, were watching where he was placed. Pray with me. Father, we pray as we hear your word today about what happened to your son and our Savior on Friday. We cannot really identify with the level of suffering and torment that Jesus endured for us on the cross. But we can't be thankful, Lord. And so, Lord, help us as we read and discover exactly what happened that day, that we can come with a reverential awe and a thankfulness of heart for what Jesus has already done, that we might know you. We pray it in his name. Amen. And we can look at the death of Jesus through two lens. We can look at death of Jesus through the lens to see that he was tried, he was convicted, he was found guilty at least by his accusers. He was punished according to their law or their custom. Or we can look through another lens and see that Jesus' death was the exact plan of God for the redemption of all lost mankind. I told you a few weeks ago about my Old Testament professor, Dr. Boo Heflin. He loved to say this. He said, while the echo of the crunching fruit was still leaving the Garden of Eden, Jesus began his journey to Calvary. And he did. As soon as man sinned and turned their back on God, his plan of redemption came into action. Jesus did all that he had to do to make sure that the Sanhedrin, the Roman government, follow through on God's plan. You see, many of the things that happened to Jesus in his last hours were foretold hundreds of years earlier by the prophets. You should have received a little sheet of paper that's white, that has a, a, a matrix on it, and it shows some, just some, a few of the Old Testament prophecies that came true in Jesus' death. We won't have time to go over that today. <clears throat> but I hope that you'll take that home and use it as a study guide this week as you consider the awe that God planned and how it all came to pass. And you think about the wisdom of God and how far the Father will go to reconcile lost sinners to himself. Three things I'd like us to talk about from our passage today. The first is this, Jesus didn't save himself, but he can save me. And what I fear has happened after 2,000 years or more of history has passed is we come to verse 25 and we read the words, or verse 24, they crucified him. And we just sort of go right past those words as if they just are meaningless. And folks, we need to understand that the crucifixion was among the, 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 the rarest and the most cruel form of torture known to man. And I can tell you the Romans were professionals at torturing people. Our Bibles contain very few details about the actual crucifixion. I think there are two reasons for that. The first reason is the people who were the original recipients of the God's Word and the Gospels, they were very familiar with what happened in a crucifixion because they saw it their entire lives. And the second reason is, is that the process of the crucifixion was not the goal of what the writers wanted us to understand, not the process, but the person of the crucifixion. They want us to remember this is Jesus, as John the Baptist, his cousin said, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And the normal procedure was that the person who was condemned would carry the cross piece of the cross, the, 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 the horizontal piece. You, if you think about strapping a railroad tie onto your back, some of these weighed at least 100 pounds, and Jesus, because the, the torture he had already endured by being scourged 39 times and going through the trial all night long, he couldn't carry that himself. And the Roman soldiers drafted a man who happened to be walking by named Simon. But I think God might have been up to something a little different that day too. Because isn't it interesting that Simon, who was a sinner, carried the cross of Jesus, who was innocent. It could have been any of us who carried that cross that day. He was being led to the place outside the city following a major thoroughfare because the Romans wanted everyone to see their crucifixion process. And they offered Jesus wine mixed with myrrh. Two times they offered in this mixture, it could have been some sort of a, a primitive anesthesia to help ease the pain of the cross. But Jesus twice 
we are told, did not take the wine. A couple of reasons for that. I think Jesus wanted to have his full senses about him as he bore the weight of the sin of the world upon his body. And secondly, you might remember from the Lord's Supper, he said, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until I drink it new with you in the kingdom of heaven. He was keeping his promise to his disciples that he would not drink wine again until he was in heaven. And after they flogged him, they put his clothes back on him. Put a purple robe on him first, and then he stripped that off and put his clothes back on him. When they got to Calvary, they stripped him of his clothes. You can imagine the clothing stuck to the bloody, drying mass of his back. He may have been able to keep his loincloth on, but basically he was laid bare as he endured the cross and the shame. Either way, he was humiliated. And there was normal practice that the guilt of the person who was being crucified had a sign, a placard, if you will, placed above their cross that indicated what they had done. We might expect to see an adulterer or a murderer or a thief. But in Jesus' case, his placard said the king of the Jews, the Jewish leaders who handed him over to the Pilate, tried to go back and have him change that to say he said he was the king of the Jews. But Pilate said, no, what has been written has been written. And the fact that Jesus was crucified between two criminals, I believe, is significant for a couple of reasons. One, it fulfills Isaiah 53. He says, he submitted himself to death and he was counted among the rebels. So Jesus is fulfilling that, but also Jesus is dying with criminals to identify himself with sinners. Did you know there is one kind of person Jesus cannot save? He cannot save a perfect individual. He came to die for sinners just like you and just like myself. So he identifies with us at the cross those who are guilty, who are deserving of death. Jesus told them, I didn't come for the healthy. They don't need a doctor. Those who are sick need a doctor. I've not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance, he tells us. And it seems to me pretty petty that the chief priests and the other religious officers come by to hurl their insults at Jesus. But our scripture tells us that's exactly what they do. And notice what they say in verse 31 and 32. They say, he saved himself. He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross so that we may see and believe. Let me tell you something. Had Jesus, by his own power, came off of that cross and walked right up to those chief priests, they still would not have believed that he is the Messiah. And if Jesus had come off of the cross and saved himself, he would not be able to save any of us. For only in his death was he able to give us life. The second truth I want us to think about is this, that even God can be forsaken. If you look at verse 33 through about verse 41, you'll see six things that took place that Mark re records for us. First thing is, at noon... It became dark, and that darkness lasted until 3 p.m. when Jesus died. He cried out in a last loud voice asking God why had he been forsaken. He let out a final breath as he breathed his last. The curtain of the sanctuary was torn in two from the top to the bottom. A Roman centurion realized he really was God's son. And there were certain women there giving witness to his death. When we bring all four Gospels alongside and read them in parallel, we see Jesus actually had seven statements from the cross. The only two that Mark records have to do with his being forsaken, with how alone Jesus was as he hung on the cross. And the darkness came over the land around noon and stayed until through. And during that time, Jesus cried out those words, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, in his native Aramaic tongue. And that darkness was not a cloud cover, it was not a solar eclipse, it was a cosmic sign from the God of heavens showing his judgment being poured out on his son as he hung on the cross. And if you'll remember, when the children of Israel were in captivity in Israel, that ninth plague that came was a period of darkness that lasted for three days. And after those three days, the angel of death appeared and passed over those who had painted the blood on the doorposts and lintels of their homes. And Jesus hung on that cross for three hours of darkness. 
And at the end of that darkness, if we will apply his blood to our lives, the angel of death will also pass over us, that we will not be condemned to die and spend eternity separated from God. That would be a great place to shout amen, church. And look what happened. He opened this new and living way. Look at verse 38. The curtain of the sanctuary was split in two from top to bottom. You know, in the Old Testament, in this time when Jesus died, if you had sinned, you had to bring a sacrifice to the temple and bring your, your dove or your pigeon or your lamb or your heifer, whatever you had, whatever you could afford, and you would have to have that sacrificed by the, by the priest who would then apply the blood sacrifice to your cause and you would be pardoned. Aren't you glad, church, you don't have to go through that anymore? Aren't you glad you don't have to go through a priest? Aren't you glad that because of Jesus' death and that, that, that sanctuary, that curtain in the sanctuary tore from the top to bottom, signifying that we forevermore have direct and full and free access to God the Father without the help of anybody else? That means that you yourself can go and stand in the presence of very God. I hope you do often. The author of Hebrews makes it so clear. Therefore, brothers, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way he has opened to us through the curtain that is his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, full assurance of the faith, sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, our bodies washed in pure water. That's what the sacrifice of Jesus did for us. Then the final thing is this. What do we do when death comes? Look at verse 42 and following. I cannot tell you any more plainly, Jesus was dead. There are some who try to explain away his death, saying that he wasn't really dead, that's how he could resurrect. No, he was dead. John 19 tells us one of the soldiers made sure by puncturing his side with a spear. They gave a report to Pilate, he is dead. And normally those crucified would be left hanging on the cross until nature took its course, but this, of course, was the preparation day, the day before the Sabbath, so they took Jesus' body off the cross. And also for Jews, they would not allow a body to hang on a tree overnight. We find in our text a man named Joseph of Arimathea. Yes, Joseph of Arimathea, who was in the same group that handed Jesus over to be crucified, now a few hours later goes to Pilate and asks permission to bury his body. Joseph was a prominent member of the Sanhedrin, we are told. But we're also told that he was looking forward to the kingdom of God. And we're told by Luke in Luke chapter 23 that he had not agreed with their plan to hand him over. Because of his love for Jesus and his belief in him, made him go public in his desire to take care of the body of Christ. And once Pilate received confirmation that Jesus really was dead, he permitted Jesus Joseph to take the body down. And he took the body and he bought some fine linen and wrapped him and placed him in a borrowed tomb, fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah 53, 9, that Jesus would be buried among the rich. And certainly he was buried in one of Joseph's own tombs. The point of the gospel writers was to make sure that their original readers and that we understand that Jesus truly died and he was really buried. And that's where the sermon ends today. Jesus has gone to the cross. He has taken our sin upon his body. He has died and he has been buried. Thank God for Friday. But in the powerful words of an African-American preacher named S.M. Lockridge, that S.M. stands for Shadrach, Meshach, Lockridge. Wouldn't you like to have that name as a child? <laughs> he reminds us that it's only Friday. It's Friday. Jesus is praying. Peter is asleep. Judas is betraying. But Sunday is coming. It's Friday. Pilate's struggling. The council is conspiring. 
the crowd is vilified. They don't even know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are running like sheep without a shepherd. Mary's crying. Peter is denying. But they don't know that Sundays are coming. It's Friday. The Romans beat my Jesus. They robe him in scar. They crown him with thorns. But they don't know that Sundays come. It's Friday. See Jesus walking to Calvary. His blood dripping. His body stumbling. And his spirit's burdened. But you see, it's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The world's winning. People are sinning. And evil's grinning. It's Friday. The soldiers nailed my Savior's hands to the cross. They nailed my Savior's feet to the cross. And then they raised him up next to criminals. It's Friday. But let me tell you something. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are questioning what has happened to their king. And the Pharisees are celebrating that their scheming has been achieved. But they don't know. It's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. He's hanging on the cross, feeling forsaken by his father, left alone and dying. Can nobody save him? Oh, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. It's Friday, the earth trembles, the sky grows dark, my king yields his spirit. It's Friday, hope is lost, death has won, sin has conquered, and Satan's just a laugh. It's Friday, Jesus is buried, a soldier stands guard, and a rock is rolled into place. But it's Friday. It is only Friday. Sunday is a coming. Thank God for Friday. Would you stand? Father, we pray that as we come to this moment of invitation that you would help us be sure we've responded to the meaning of Friday we've responded and we've applied the blood that you shed to our sin so Lord I pray specifically right now for any person here a man or woman a boy or a girl that has never trusted in Jesus and your blood as sufficient to pay for our sin that today would be a day of celebration and rejoicing that we can say, my sin has been rolled off. It's been washed away. Lord, would you save some? Draw them to yourself, Lord. You've been lifted up today through the music and through your word. Magnified, Lord. Draw people to yourself right now. I pray it in Jesus' name. I'll be here to receive you, to help you if you need to make a decision, especially to trust Christ as your Savior. Anything else is okay as well, but if you need to trust Jesus, would you please, please come today.
Amen. Wonderful day in the Lord's house. Thank you for the choir, for Jackie. Be, be sure to remember him in your prayers this week as he recovers. But it's been a great day. Amen. Amen. Let's join hands across the aisle. We'll be dismissed in prayer. I want to remind you, if you want to go grab your lawn chairs out of your car, you can. Or we can get seats over there. But come over to the gym right now for our picnic. There is a cornhole tournament, I've been told. And there are prizes that are available. So when you walk in, there's a sign-up sheet if you want to sign up. For that tournament, you can do that. Uh, but just come and enjoy the food and the fellowship. We'll have a great time together. Jim Kasten, would you pray us out?